Hey everyone, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology, and today I am joined by my friend and colleague Alex Amorosi to look at your Sun and Rising sign horoscopes for the month of April. So we're going to be focusing on a couple of transits happening in the sign of Aries this month and giving you a feel for where that lands in your birth chart um, according to your Sun or Rising sign, whichever one you tend to listen to. And we'll tell you a little bit about why we recommend your Rising sign in a minute. But before I do that and we get into it, don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel to grow and you can find a transcript of today's talk on the website, nightlightastrology.com. Um, as always, so glad to have you here, Alex. Welcome back. Thanks, Adam. Good to be back. Right back. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can find Alex's work, by the way, alexamorosi.com. You can find him on Instagram where he makes all sorts of awesome astrology-related content at Alex Amorosi Healing. Um, really glad to have you back to discuss the transits of the month. We're going to be looking at two transits this month um, because these are really the uh, heart of April's astrology, and that is the... Uh, Sun-Jupiter conjunction that's happening on April 11th in the sign of Aries, followed by a solar eclipse at the anoretic 29th degree of Aries uh, that's also happening on April 20th. So uh, right kind of the middle of the month where these two transits are happening, that's where we are going to focus our attention. Um, before we uh, get into it per sign, um, I want to just bring up the real-time clock and show everybody uh, the transits that we're looking at so that you can actually see them. So um, first of all, here is the Sun-Jupiter conjunction. This is April 11th. And then what I want to do is just kind of speed this up by a few days. And here you can see on April 19th that we have, uh, actually, it's it's depending on your time zone, it is the 19th into the 20th. So if we fast forward this conjunction just a little bit, you'll see that, you know, this is 1030 PM or so on the 19th, but it can go into the 20th, depending on like where you're at in the world. So I have it listed as the 20th on the screen, but it's sort of 19th on the, in the program. It's right around there though. So the 11th, the sun conjoins Jupiter. And then we have the solar eclipse on the 19th evening of the 19th into the 20th. That solar eclipse is at the 29th anoretic degree of Aries uh, with Jupiter close behind. So these two transits are the major transits of the month. What we're going to do is start by putting Aries on the ascendant, and we're going to take this around the wheel. What I'm going to do in the meantime is um, just tell you why we recommend your rising sign. So for those of you guys who are newer to horoscopes, Horoscopes are done through the use of whole sign houses, uh, which means that if you look at your chart through whole sign houses, which is what Hellenistic astrologers do, that's the kind of astrology that I practice and teach, then your rising sign will configure, the rising sign horoscope will configure with your birth chart, which means that when we look at the whole sign house placements of the transits, which is usually our focus in horoscopes, you're going to get a one-to-one -one correspondence with your birth chart, which is why we always recommend the rising sign. If you use the sun sign, what you're doing is you're taking the sun sign and you're putting the sun sign as the first house of the chart, which if it is not the first house of your natal chart will mean that it is a sort of symbolic chart and not at all literally configured to your natal chart, which some people will use in a kind of divinatory way. Um, and, and find resonance with, and there's no problem with that. But if you want the one that's most accurately configured to your birth chart, you go with the rising sign. So you could listen to this, you could listen to either or both. Uh, we recommend the rising sign. Mm -hmm. So on that note, we are looking at these two events, sun conjunct Jupiter and solar eclipse in Aries. And we're gonna kind of gel them together by talking about the topics of the house. Um, usually what we do is we'll trade off talking about signs and filling in for each other. So for Aries, I'm going to let Alex kick us off today and tell us what he thinks uh, Aries rising folk have in store for them this month. And then I'm going to chime in with some thoughts of my own after I've let him uh, go through his and we'll do well, then we'll alternate like that through the signs. You know, it's, it's really interesting for Aries risings this month, Adam, because um, this cycle of Jupiter began in your 12th house last year in Pisces. So that's a sort of much more introspective, emotional uh look at the those more shadow or secret spaces of the psyche and now you're coming into a much almost the polar opposite type of aspect in your first house which is big it is out there it is extroverted it is uh 
highly dr- dramatic in some sense, very based on leadership. It's a much more visible style of aspect. So I'm really wondering for, for Aries Rising with the Sun, Jupiter particularly, if there's been something you've been working through over the last year or so related to your beliefs and the way you make cohesion and meaning out of reality, the way it relates to your ideals that have felt a little bit more emotional, maybe a little bit more behind the scenes that are ready for sort of like their moment in the sun. Now to take that work and bring it out and on it, you know, the, what I'm taking is a theme for this Sun, Jupiter through all the houses is a sense of visibility and leadership and the ability to take what you've learned and use it towards a more forward motion, um, visible, noble purpose. That's mm-hmm. how I, I kind of lead off for Aries Risings. Yeah, I love that. And I would also say that as we're seeing this solar eclipse in the first house, the transformation of health, appearance, physique, yeah. identity, um, transformation in your self-concept, uh, that's been cooking for a while, like Alex said, that's ready to take a next step or be more visible in some way. Um, characteristics or qualities of yourself that you're ready to embody in other areas of your life because they've had time to cook within you, whether that's work or love or home or whatever. Um, I also think that there's a transition that's occurring with these planets getting ready to move into your second house that would tell me that whatever you've been working on within yourself might be ready to uh, get translated into financial or business success somewhere in the not too distant future. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah, that, agreed. Let's go forward and I'll lead us off on Taurus. Uh, for Taurus risings, this falls into your 12th house. Um, this is uh, really an interesting place because it's a place that has to do with unconscious material as well as things that are act as hidden or subtle enemies or detractors, whether they're within yourself or coming from someone else. Uh, it's also about the things we can't see or the things we struggle to incorporate uh, into our conscious understanding of ourselves. but we really need to. It's the work that we have to do to understand this 12th house material. Um, As a Taurus rising myself, for example, I reflect on the fact that um, a real underdeveloped part of my psychology since Jupiter enter Aries that I've been very actively working on has been the masculine components, the gym, the, the love of competitive sports, and the attempt to own and integrate that side of myself, which I've always felt like was not very enlightened. You know, this is a very like very Aries 12th house kind of shadow material to be working with. Um, also one of the things that I've been more proactive about in the past year, as I'm reflecting on this is, um, I've had more of an overt and direct way of dealing with trolls and, and, um, like people sending me hate letters and stuff like that, which I've gotten regularly for years. But since Jupiter entered the 12th, I've been more actively, you know, kind of standing up for myself, I guess you could say. Um, I feel like the, that kind of shadow material is reaching, um, a, a point of completion and closure that there's a transit it's like you've you've um you've dueled with your own demons you know and you've <laughs> you've you've worked through things if you're a Taurus rising transition of Jupiter into the first house is now ready to incorporate some of those things more consciously um so that's kind of I see this transition point there but it is like a last there could be like an end level boss of some kind that you mm-hmm. also have to uh to deal with and um you know bring your lightsaber i guess <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, this could definitely be a Obi Wan falling falling into that uh that trap of all those droids in one of those movies, right? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, oh, shit, right. But I think you know it's interesting too, Adam. You know, going after the eclipse from that too. I think the eclipse is a fascinating way to be culminating that type of transit because it's sort of the slipstream that you might need to move into that new iteration of self that is called by as everything starts to move into your first house Taurus rising right because everything's going to start to move into the way you see yourself how you're perceived by the world <laughs> it's it I, it's an odd way to use the word for an eclipse but it almost feels like an integration of sorts you know that mm-hmm. doesn't feel like a very, very eclipse type word but i think for this one it really fits especially that the you know it's right on that 29th degree about just about to tip in yep. to the first house yeah yeah, for sure. And it's uh, with the, the fact that the sun's also moving into the first and immediately squaring Pluto in the 10th says to me that there's something that you're ready to, to, to show or share or embody that has been in the works behind the scenes that you've been wrestling with somehow. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that that strikes me as a, a nice spot. I think this is a brighter 12th house dynamic than a lot of 12th house dynamics could be. So that that's encouraging. Mm-hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, with Gemini's rising, um, we got the stellium taking place here. 
uh, in the 11th house. Oops, let's go forward here. Here we got this, uh, the eclipse. You can kind of see the eclipse forming there in the 11th. Uh, lead us off with this one, Alex. What do you think? Well, I mean, you know, really just classic 11th, stuff, 11th house stuff that comes to mind quickly is, is you know, taking on a real leadership role. Adam and I were talking in our monthly overview about how Jupiter and the sun are both planets very much associated with leadership. Um, I always think the sun is more about like executive leadership and Jupiter about sort of legislative or judicial leadership, but about leadership. And so there's... There's a sense here of maybe it's in your social professional networks or amongst your all of your allies that there's you taking the reins of something here. You feeling like there's a there's a purpose or some, a mission that you want to drive towards within the, those networks that is allowing you to feel more like you are the leading the tribe here, that you're taking people down the path to a collective purpose and letting yourself feel like you can really take on that mantle of prominence. You know, this mm. is a very prominent aspect too, I think. And, and it, uh, there's so much that Gemini's have in that you, you, one of those great strengths, I think of Gemini rising, right. Is the ability to sort of pop between different social groups and pop between different people at parties and sort of be able to transfer the information mm -hmm. around. And I feel like there's kind of a coalescing here in the 11th house. It's actually nice with this, where it allows you to be um, more prominent rather than and um, singled out as a leader, as opposed to sort of one who's facilitating information amongst many. I love that, especially with Venus in the first house, right? You get the feeling and Saturn in the 10th too. It's like, I feel good about myself. The mantle of leadership and greater responsibility is forming around me. Um, I can also get the feeling of like really exciting new projects or collaborations mm -hmm. with other people developing, uh, maybe trying to deal with some financial problems with Mars fallen in the second, but it, it's like, these are good opportunities that are coming up here. Um, maybe also taking a look at what kinds of people or groups or things haven't been as supportive and realizing that this other group would be more supportive or this other um, uh, this other set of goals or ambitions is ready to replace one that's not like delivering any longer or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then you have the eclipse for, for Gemini. So, you know, the, that, you know, will start to tip right into your 12th house. So there might be something there too around, uh, let, letting that also you know, the excavation of the, the 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 shadow parts of the psyche not shadow isn't dark or bad but just the parts that are unseen this might be sort of a slipstream into that that's that's assisting you in this process in some way mm, yeah as you move forward yeah yeah good call uh let's move on to cancer um i'll start us off on this one we've got the cancer risings um you've got the eclipse in your 10th house but it's hosted by fallen mars in your first um you know, for me, I get the feeling one iteration of this would be like, I've had enough. <laughs> I have had enough. <laughs> right. Because you get the kind of the Mars and cancer in the first house is going to make you really clear of a uh, clear about where your edges are emotionally and personally, like where you're just like, I'm, I'm fed up. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I'm frustrated. I'm agitated. The eclipse in the 10th, especially in the workplace or with your professional endeavors, you get the feeling of if if you need to if you're hitting an edge, this will be a tipping point that can be like, okay, that was emotionally clarifying. Now I'm not going to do this anymore, or I'm going to quit my job, or I'm going to uh, start my own company, or that it would probably be because something's reaching a boiling point. Um, yeah. And then you know, I think the promise of this is that you're really donezo when it's at the 29th degree. It's like done, done, um, and and yet it's a transition. I love, I love that the sun is moving right into the 11th house um, and sort of immediately reconfiguring long-term dreams and plans and who are the right people to be with and who aren't Venus is in the 12th house kind of, it's a, it's a clarifying moment about who your people are and aren't and um, not entirely easy to see all of that, but um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be at a point where things you haven't been able to see are becoming clearer, but maybe because you're hitting an edge. Yeah, absolutely. I love that, Adam. Um, I was thinking of, you know, you're, I was thinking of Mars and cancer and I think to some degrees, Mars and Pisces can be like this too, but Mars and water, uh, there, there can sometimes be the sacrificial, right? That maybe that you're seen as the person who, you know, does everything or takes on everything, or is maybe that's a role that unintentionally you've walked into. And now you're thinking, 
you know what? Uh, I am ready for Fiji and the beach and a whole, <laughs> a whole other way that's focused a little bit more on, on me. Um, I think that, you know, that, you know, Mars might be pointing to that as the host of the eclipse, but I think also like, you know, noticing Jupiter and the sun coming together here in the career house, there's, it might, I could see this too, Adam, as something of like, you know what, I'm, I'm done with the corporate world. I'm done with feeling like I'm a cog in the wheel and I am taking on my own business. I am taking on my own endeavor. I am going to be my own leader, my own boss, my own, you know, that, that sort of idea I could see coming up or those ideas starting to formulate. And that, as Adam was saying, with the sun tipping into your 11th house and then conjunct the North node, being drawn to the right networks that can support you in those types of endeavors if they start to come up for you if those ideas are coming up yeah yeah, yeah. that's a great way of putting it uh let's move along to leo rising um this places that stellium uh the eclipse into your ninth house um and uh you know an interesting interesting place for sure but i'll before i chime in alex you you start us off on this one I was thinking, like, you can't really get a more ninth house combination of planets than the Sun and Jupiter. Uh, it's an interesting, it's a really congruent house with those planets. And I think this is a place where I might see, with Mars moving to the 12th house in Cancer as the host, a place for Leo Risings where you're just illuminating and moving through any of those last places in your psyche where you feel like there's sort of an inner con emotional conflict or there's a place where you're not feeling safe to be seen or you're not feeling safe to feeling like if you're if you're out and in the world there's a sense of danger you're really really realizing that you're safe to be out and in the world and seen and in the ninth house i could see as a counselor as a leader as a spiritual teacher as a uh, i could see you know, maybe putting down um, if you've been on any sort of journey of healing, so to speak, being like maybe that's starting to wind up with these last little movements of Mars through the 12th house. And now you're setting on to take up sort of a leadership role in spirituality or a leadership role in a religious community. Um, I could also see for, you know, just the classic ninth house thing here with Jupiter and the sun together, Adam, is travel like a big trip. As a Leo uh -huh. rising, I'm planning a couple of trips at the end of the year. So it's like just things, just something like that could be yeah. very prominent here too. Yeah it, it, yeah. it strikes me also as a moment of like, like the scientific revolution or like, you know, Thomas Kuhn writing about paradigm changes. Um, this strikes me as a tipping point that could at least initiate the beginning of a very intense and important paradigm change uh, of change of beliefs, a change of religious or philosophical affiliation, even a change in the philosophy informing how you do something like astrology, like, oh, well, um, you know, for example, I could see this being uh, in the, the chart of someone who's ready to, um, you know, well, well, like, for example, you've just graduated uh, the horary program. I could see someone, a Leo rising, like you just graduating that program being like, I'm going to start to offer horary charts, right? where there's some different um, if you're a ninth house, if you're someone who has a ninth house practice, right? If you're a teacher, if you're an educator, if you're a spiritual, you know, you have spiritual offerings or something that this could actually represent a change in the type of approach you take, um, mm -hmm. like de developing a new curriculum. If you're a teacher at, at college or something, going back to school comes to mind, um, mm -hmm. going to see, go going to live in an ashram for a minute. Uh, departing a religious group because you've reached a, a, a point of no return, a difference ideologically or something. So it, it strikes me as really important. And, and also, I think part of this has to do with that the changes in the ninth house are being coupled with the need to look at unrecognized or unvalidated needs or emotions with Mars in the 12th. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. Interesting transit for that, yeah. Yeah, let's go on to Virgo. Um, this place is the stellium in the eighth, maybe one of the harder placements to talk about in my mind. Um, this may have something to do with uh, how you are bound to other people and needing to be, uh, you know, needing to be freed from the expectations or obligations of other people. Could also be a moment where the, you know, the, the generosity is running out, um, almost like a you know, the, the, the eclipse in this house can signal like you're not going to receive 
child support for very much longer because your kid's ready to graduate and the, then the child support's going to end from your ex. Um, it could be about um, some bond or soul contract being ready to separate because it's fin it's like it's reached its expiration date. Um, it also makes me wonder about, um, you know, the difference between, you know, in some cultures, like if you give a gift, you have to give one in return because gifts are thought of as curses if they're not given, if you don't give someone back something. It makes me wonder about those kinds of dynamics as well. Also, the topic just, you know, kind of basic eighth house topic of death and, and deep transitions where uh, some former way of life is dying metaphorically or in some cases literally. Uh, so that element of death comes to my mind as well. But those are some of the things that uh, jump out at me. What about you? You know, I, I keep thinking about with the eighth house. I, I love that. I, I... Jupiter to me in the eighth house is it, it, Jupiter is trying to bring cohesion wherever it goes, wherever sign it's in, it's trying to bring some sense of cohesion, some sense of meaning, some sense of order. I, I'm wondering if this is, you know, with this cycle with Jupiter having begun in your seventh house, if there's stuff around it, it last year and now culminating this year, you know, if there's something around relationships, your ideas around relationships, your ideas around romantic relationships, where there's you're you're letting go of an old philosophy around them and maybe how you've gotten entangled or drawn into karmic bonds you didn't necessarily want to be drawn mm -hmm. into where Jupiter allows you to in some way formulate a new philosophy, a new ideal is co-present with you know with the sun and conjunct with the sun, but also allow you to um, make me you know i think one of the best ways one of the ways we heal so often out is we need to make meaning out of things that's one of the mm -hmm. primary ways that we heal and you know, we make meaning out of you know how if i have to let this go or if i had to formulate a new philosophy how i make meaning out of what happened and then move forward but you have the eclipse here right about to tip into the ninth house and so i would say like you know that's a really interesting idea of like a slipstream i always think of like the eclipse creates like a two-week window of a slipstream where Again, I think that would might further the exploration of beliefs and how those beliefs allow you to sort of cut the karmic ties necessary to move forward. That's yeah. why I would see that one. That's nice, especially with Jupiter transitioning into the ninth as well, right behind it. That, yeah. I, I really like that. Yeah, it's a nice yeah. way of looking at it. Let's go ahead to Libra. Uh, this place is the um, combination of planets uh, into the seventh house. Um, the, the eclipse is there. Sun conjunct Jupiter is there. Um, what do you think about Libra rising in this landing in the seventh? I mean, you know, I think that that's, that's a sign of like, that could be a really prominent relationship or dating somebody very prominent. If you're not in a relationship, maybe you wind up dating someone who's in some sort of leadership role or very public or prominent in society. Um, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely one where you might, you know, it's, it's a passionate aspect. It's a, it's an aspect that has a lot of fire behind it, uh, where you might feel like there's a sudden, like lots going on either in your relationship or lots of potential or, or, you know, possibilities in dating. I could also see though, you know, be very mindful with the eclipse that's about to tip into the eighth house, who you are entangled with and who you're thinking of becoming entangled with, because that eclipse might feel a little bit like, again, like this, this water slide that you're on that once you're on, it might feel a little bit difficult to manage. So, you know, I would say be enthusiastic, be excited. Those are all sort of sun Jupiter combinations and just be mindful of what the entanglement is creating as you're going along. Yeah, um, that's well said. And I would say I would add to that with Mercury about to retrograde in the eighth, mm -hmm. the Pluto or the sun entering the eighth, Jupiter entering the eighth um, on the heels of this eclipse that if you're in a partnership, exciting new possibilities in your partner's work or business could be of like mm -hmm. a sort of peripheral manifestation. Um, and anything that <clears throat> The, the feeling, like you said, of like a prominent person or the offer to partner with someone, maybe for the sake of um, partnering assets or business um, goals or something like that, I, I could see that coming together here. Um, but also like changes around partnership and money and jobs and um, financial things within a relationship uh, comes to my mind as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, let's go on to, whoops. Let's go on to Scorpio rising, which takes 
our stellium and eclipse sun jupiter conjunction eclipse at the last degree of aries into the sixth house with mars in the ninth as well in its fall i'm just like wow this one really strikes me as um the emotional advocacy fighting on behalf of things that you believe in or care about this feels like mission driven very emotional protect those who are bullied um or a theme of seeking out support or like sanctuary from from uh, a storm like you know uh -huh. the, the ninth house mars and cancer feels to me like a domestic abuse shelter um mm -hmm. that that's there maybe hosted by a religious organization that's there to reach out for people who are getting beat up um yeah. it also feels to me like someone who is maybe not thinking clearly and like wildly combative because of um the, their their emotional convictions are boiling over and maybe in a way that's like not totally healthy um mm -hmm. this also strikes me though as like um your your emotions your convictions will lead the way and will have you working really hard or sacrificing or fighting on behalf of something uh, maybe exhausting you or draining you or getting you unnecessarily caught up in in drama so i would be careful of like emotional self-righteousness this month passive aggressiveness and maybe seeking out principled conflicts that you, you you think they're principled but they might be more rooted in interpersonal or subjective dynamics than you're willing to admit those are some of the things that come to mind it's a little sticky one for scorpios this month but i do feel like the benefit of it is um you know that the, the the emotional convictions and the willingness to work on their behalf could could be um really beneficial too yeah, i love that adam and you know i think you know one thing I, I would just really emphasize that you're saying here is is with the sixth this happening in the sixth house and the south node in your first house ruled by and ruled by a fallen Mars. Be really mindful of how much you're giving it. Is it exhausting your body? Is it depleting yes. your system? Is it taking down your vitality? This is something where if I you know I was seeing a client's chart, I would probably say like you want to be really careful that you're you're taking care of yourself too and your health during a transit like this because especially sun jupiter in the sixth house there could be like a, i just can't ignore this anymore people cannot be treated like this this person cannot be treated like this and to really go to town for it and that's a wonderful thing i think it's really knowing for scorpio rises this month the line where's the line where i have to like i have to shut down for a second so that i'm able to continue with that task because it could really snowball quickly i think with this yeah. kind of energy that's yeah. a great point the snowballing quickly is is to me that's like yeah. loud and clear with this one yeah. um sagittarius rising we are going to uh let me just back this up by one day now quickly so we get the moon back in there uh so <clears throat> Sagittarius rising places these planets in the fifth house place. It was called the house of good fortune associated with um, pleasure and creativity and children and lots of other fun things. Um, what do you see from this one, Alex? Well, you know, if I just take this just as kids, you know, your kids quickly, if you have children, I, I could see this as like one of your children suddenly becoming prominent or brought into a leadership role. Like a really simple thing would be like, you know, being elected class president or, you know, getting a very prominent job of some sort, you know, if they're just taking the fifth houses for kids. But I could also see this just being really fun. I think, you know, it's, it's a really fun uh, kind of brash, sassy transit through the fifth house here where, you, you know, there's a lot of potential for if you've been holding back on creativity, if you felt like, you haven't been able to be creative. You haven't been able to express yourself or your sexuality in a way you wanted to. This is a transit where that could really bloom and open up in some really cool ways. Um, you know, the caveat is I was, this, this, the, the eclipse now is going to lead into your sixth house. So you would want to, you know, just keep an eye on anything in, with Jupiter and the sun and Aries that feels like it goes way too far too fast because the sixth house, it might feel like there's a period where you have to – uh, there's a harder work period related to that, a longer term, harder work period that's related to that. But in general, I think it's a pretty fun transit for a Sagittarius. Yeah. I would add, in addition to this being uh, maybe a um, turning point for like creativity and self-expression um, and, and the desire to do something sort of bold or provocative, um, the creative impulse here is really strong could see it not like i don't love aries in the fifth so much for like a pregnancy transit but jupiter in the fifth i do and then the solar eclipse sometimes you do see pregnancies coming out of that um 
Hmm. Mars in the eighth and cancer simultaneously does make me feel like you could be seeing your, you know, I'm now, um, I'm responsible for my kids problems. Like, <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. my, my mm -hmm. kid is, um, getting called into the office or my kid has having some emotional issues or outbursts or something. Yeah. So it's interesting because the other thing that comes to mind is like, if a kid gets really good at something and really invested in something, suddenly you become responsible to pay for their swim clubs, take them to all the swim meets. I just kept thinking of like, wouldn't this be funny if you started seeing a parent whose kids started doing really well at swimming, but now they're swimming year round, they're in clubs year round, you're paying for coaches year round, the, <laughs> the Mars and the water sign in the eighth suddenly bonds you yeah. to their success in a way that's a little draining, you know? <laughs> I love I love this analysis from he who has children and he who does not have children. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Different thought. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's beautiful. <laughs> well, let's go on to Capricorn rising. Uh, Cap rising places this Sun Jupiter conjunction and the eclipse uh, into the fourth house this month. Um, that is the place of home and family. Uh, for Capricorn risings, this could go in a number of different directions. I mean, this solar eclipse in the fourth house, along with Jupiter, can sometimes point to the death of, uh, um, you know, elders, like grandparents, you know, people passing over, a generational turnover. That can also mean buying or selling property in the fourth house, moving, re you know, redoing things in the home environment uh, with um, the sense that, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, I'm going to reset my house. And that is it's symbolic for a reset that I'm trying to do in my life overall. So kind of reset fresh energy around home, family, parents, sort of the death and rebirth motif with the anoretic solar eclipse, but like a Jupiter there. I also wonder about how changing home or environment is a part of a puzzle leading to greater creative satisfaction or freedom uh, with Jupiter about to enter the fifth. Um, so those things come to my mind. Also looking potentially at some level of conflict within the family. How am I a part of a group versus how do I stand apart from a group, especially the family group comes to mind with like Aries energy in the fourth. Uh, that's what I've got for this one. What about you, Alex? I was thinking, you know, with a fallen Mars in the seventh, definitely ask your spouse before you rearrange, rearrange the house. <laughs> if yeah. Just gonna say, <laughs> why did you put the couch? What are you thinking? <laughs> yeah, totally. But yeah, I think there's um, you know, just kind of riffing off a couple of those ideas, Adam. You know, if there is a generational turnover, you know, Sun and Jupiter, maybe that puts you in a place of greater leadership within the family. That this is a place where it sort of puts you at the head of the table. Um, and that can, you know. Saturn, we think more about responsibility, but I always think, you know, Sun Jupiter is like noticeable. That's that noticeable aspect to it. Um, I could definitely see this too being a, a pretty good transit for moves if you're considering moves, if you're thinking about moving house and actually changing your physical house. It can be good too. It's just really considering that Mars is fallen uh, in the seventh house while you're doing, making any of those plans. So, you know, uh, double checking everything, any anything around home or your marriage, or if you're making a move like that, you know that that it's moving forward in its unified front and not feeling like there's conflict coming up because the decisions being made that someone didn't know everything about that sort of idea. Yeah, um, that makes me think too that the family, um, any kind of family drama or focus on family karma could stretch into or extend into the spouse or partner's family as well yeah. with Mars in the seventh. Um, yeah. Let's go ahead to Aquarius. Um, Alex, you can lead us off. This places the stellium into the third house with the Jupiter Sun conjunction uh, on the 11th and then the solar eclipse on the 19th into the 20th. Uh, what do you think about this placement? Could see this as, you know, I was thinking about this. Now I know Mars has fallen in the sixth house, so I'm going to leave that as a caveat. But I could see Jupiter here if, if there's been conflict or sort of like, net one upping that's been happening amongst siblings or maybe cousins or there's a sense of like cohesion wanting to happen here there's a sense of like can we all come into one unified sense of ideal that some you know often associate i i put cousins too in the third house but siblings definitely um you could also see like you know adam i've really been enjoying the way you talk about the third house as the environment and with the moon there present too right the idea of the environment of like a Am I in an environment that I can actually shine in? And I mean, am in am I in an environment where I feel I have to fight to be seen? And is there some way where like my immediate 
surrounding space and that which surrounds me needs to change somewhat so that I feel like my my most lit up self, so to speak, is allowed to really come to the forefront. Um, and then you've got an eclipse that's going to tip into your fourth house and you have, um, you know, definitely with eclipses, eclipses, you know, one of the big watchwords you hear in astrology is eclipses bring change, but they bring change by you letting go into the change. So I'm wondering if there's something going on around your, the way you work around within your environment and the allowing yourself to feel more prominent allows you to move into this more sort of undercurrent where you just kind of surrender to the change that shifts the private sphere of your life in the fourth house or your relationship to your home or your ancestry or something like that. Yeah, it's interesting because Pluto's just entered your first house if you're in Aquarius. Uh -huh. And so that catalyst of let's transform, um, let's, you know, die and be reborn is making itself felt right now for Aquarius risings um, as it's doing so. And you see this eclipse in the third. And like you said, then it's, it's kind of going right into the fourth house. It makes me wonder about, OK, this this personal transformation is being addressed immediately in terms of environmental concerns or concerns around home or living environment or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. mine too. I mean, the third house obviously could be about, well, as I'm changing, I'm becoming outspoken about something or I'm, I'm becoming more vocal or expressive about this, this presence of change that's trying to establish itself within me. But that would also go along with the need to shift or change the environment around you somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, last but not least, we have Pisces rising, and that places the Sun-Jupiter conjunction in your second, along with the solar eclipse in your second. And um, that is, uh, that's, a, that's a huge transit um, for the sake of business, money, finances, assets, and resources. You get the feeling of either being, um, you know, finishing the development or cultivation of something at the 29th degree, like you've been building and developing something and now it's, it's ready to transition into, you know, launching a business or offering a product or offering a service or, or it could be a culmination of something that you have been doing and developing that you're ready to let go of. But I like this as uh, developmental prospects around business and money uh, development of skills, abilities, knowledge, that anything that can benefit and support you um, and and sort of um, be an asset or resource to you. And the development of those things, as well as like a, a culmination or a critical turning point around things that you've already been building or developing. That comes to my mind. Of course, um, I think that with Mars in Cancer in the fifth house, some question about creative happiness is at play here too. Like, mm you know, am I doing things? Am I, am I developing or cultivating things the way I earn money? Does it make me happy? Do I feel creatively fulfilled by it? Uh, that might be a question as well. It could also be that something feels like it's draining or challenging your, your joy, like something's draining a uh, kill joy is what I'm trying to say. What is mm. killing your joy? What is stealing your resources that you have to sort of fight and, and establish some boundaries around? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I love that. I love that. I mean, you know, it, it, first I see, you know, Jupiter and the sun moving into the second house. I'm like, get that paper, Pisces. Like, let's go. You know, like that's, that's <laughs> there's it's a great money signature, um, you know, and I would I would say, you know, I'm, I'm kind of I've been thinking about this transit a lot in terms of the sequence of the Jupiter, the, the this Jupiter cycle, which began for Pisces with Jupiter in your first house. Right. So you're you're sort of coming out of maybe a more, you know, you've had Neptune there for a long time, you know, you have Saturn there, but you know, over the last year, a little bit more of like a, what are the more intangible, uh, emotional, psychological aspects of myself that I've spent some time reviewing, especially my emotional sphere as Pisces that now I'm ready to maybe not necessarily monetize, but bring out into the world in a way that brings me resource. Um, mm. And allows me, you know, allows me to feel supported, not just that it has to be my own internal process, but as it bring it out into the world, it allows me to feel supported by that work that's happened over the course of the last Jupiter cycle. So, yeah. 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 Really nice. I think we did a pretty nice job uh, today of going through all 12 signs. I hope that all of you out there who were listening to this were able to uh, get some good information and um, feel prepared for 
uh, those big transits in your in your whole sign house of Aries this month. Um, we'd love to hear stories from you guys. So leave comments uh, in the comments section. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you want to find a transcript of today's talk, it's always on the website. I also uh, say thank you to Alex and point you over to his website, alexamorosi.com or his Instagram, which is alexamorosihealing, where he regularly shares um, great, great uh, astrology content. Um, Alex, as always, thanks so much for being here and uh, giving us all of your great insights and helping us, uh, helping me not go crazy doing horoscopes by myself. <laughs> I live to serve, man. <laughs> I'm here for you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, everybody, for listening, and we will see you all again next month. Bye, everyone.